Hi, I'm Sean Pacera. I'm the garden manager here at Heifer Ranch. And today we're gonna to be talking about greenhouses, why we use them, what we put in them, and why our greenhouses are designed the way that they are. If you're excited to learn about high tunnels, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. So in the market garden, we have three production systems that are all running simultaneously. We have tractor cultivated crops, which would be like our carrots and cabbages. We have our market garden crops, would be things like our greens that are in a permanent raised bed. And then we have our high tunnel crops. These would be things that don't like to get rain, like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. Things that enjoy the additional heat, like peppers, tomatoes, and ginger. Things that may be prone to uh, diseases from excess moisture, like strawberries. They have a rotation that they go through in our greenhouses. Uh, we'll continue to add new crops to that rotation. Additional benefit to the greenhouses is that they shield the plants from the rain. And being in the hot, swampy south, that's really important for disease control, as a lot of disease moves through rain and infects other plants around an infected plant. The main benefit that we get here in Arkansas from using these high tunnels is we can get a jump on the spring. You can plant a little bit later in the fall. It allows us to do greens year round. So we'll do baby spinach, baby kale, baby arugula, lettuces, radishes, baby carrots that we can just harvest and plant a new crop that same day. And we do those in a very high rotation all through the winter. So we're harvesting and planting every single week um, from November through March until we start emptying the tunnels to get ready for more tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers. So today at the ranch, we are building our third high tunnel. We have built one each year since I've started. Uh, they come from Zimmerman's out of Missouri and are rated for wind and snow and anything that nature can throw at them. So they're pretty hefty. The tunnel behind me is a 30 foot by 96 foot tunnel. It has the W trusses, which is probably the most beefy of the, the support systems you can get inside. Uh, the side walls are five foot tall and the bows are on five foot centers. So this is pretty much the standard that most uh, growers, professional growers are using. Uh, it uses drop curtains versus the roll-up sides. So even with all these additional things, the tunnel is about uh, around $11,000 for the kit. So when you're looking at a high tunnel, there's a lot of different options to consider. They can be different lengths and widths, uh, different types of trussing, which is the amount of support that's inside the tunnel, different size of walls, heights, and whether they roll up or drop down. These all are important based on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, your proximity to electricity or water, what kind of crops you have in there, if you're able to get to your greenhouse quickly or on the weekends if you live on site. So some of the anatomy of the greenhouse is what we're looking at here, which is the end wall. So you have end walls on, on both sides, usually with doors on both sides. Uh, side walls would be the areas on the side that have the curtain either that rolls up or drops down. So when we get into winter and especially in early spring, it can be really important to adjust the temperature in the greenhouse for excess heat. So as we know, heat rises. So it's possible for your tunnel or likely that it catches a lot of heat at the top of the tunnel. If you're using only roll-up sides to vent out that excess heat, it's hard for the heat to go down and out of the tunnel. And also, whenever you start to roll up those sides on a cold day, the first thing to come into the tunnel is really cold air at the ground level. So if our plants are newly transplanted at the bottom, we want to be able to let off the excess heat without bringing in a lot of new cold air. Uh, with the drop curtain system that we have, we can let down just a little bit to let off some of that excess heat. Whereas if we were using the cheaper roll-up sides, you'd have really hot air at the top of the tunnel and then really cold air at the bottom of the tunnel. And so another consideration for us is that we are only working Monday through Friday. We try and get all of our tasks done eight to five Monday through Friday. We have timers set on a few things to carry us through the weekend, but generally no one's working on the weekend. And so we've had to set up our greenhouses in a way to where it doesn't require someone coming in to raise and lower sides or open and close doors, uh, unless there's some sort of storm you know, coming in. And so we chose these uh, 10 foot double doors uh, because they allow a lot of airflow through there. So if we are expecting some maybe cooler temperatures, but not 
real bad. We can go ahead and put up the sides on the greenhouse on Friday, but just leave the doors open over the weekend. We use these, these larger doors to help with excess ventilation through the summer as well. Having the sides all the way open, having the doors all the way open really helps let off that excess heat. And because our whole garden is on a pretty good slope, the flattest part in our garden area is at the bottom of the hill. So we wound up putting our greenhouses near the bottom of the hill, which puts it on flatter ground, which is, is a, a better grade for constructing a greenhouse. But it also put us further away from our power source. So there's no propane, there's no electricity in these tunnels. So because of that, we went for a taller door instead of a shorter, smaller door we could walk through with a vent up top because we knew we wouldn't be able to power that vent. Or if that vent got somehow jammed on the weekend and no one was here to help open it, then it would get too hot in the tunnel. Another consideration for the doors too is if you plan on using a tractor in your tunnel. So with a door this size, you would be able to put down the roll bar on the tractor and be able to drive a 40 horsepower tractor inside if you were spreading compost or ripping the soil. Uh, if you do not plan on using a tractor or even a BCS, then it becomes a lot easier to, to use a smaller door, especially if you're north further north, like north of Arkansas. We use the full-size door mainly for ventilation. We don't ever take a tractor in there. We may occasionally use a BCS two-wheel tractor, but usually not. It's all hand-powered tools and no-till. So the crops that I've named so far, the tomatoes, the peppers, the cucumbers, all require support. So they're plants that need some sort of structure to climb. And for us, that's string. So we hang from electrical conduit on the trusses in our greenhouse. We have the purlins, which are what span the greenhouse. And those can be either in just a hoop or a Quonset style, which has a peak to it. The peak is really important if you're in an area that has snow because it helps shed the snow off the side. A more rounded shape may hold some of that snow. And then in on the purlin, we have the truss system. So this is a W truss and you can get just a V truss, which just goes one down and one over. Uh, and then you can also have no truss. If you don't plan on supporting any crops and you're in an area that doesn't get a lot of snow, you may not use that the truss system and you could save some money there. So when it came to choosing what style of greenhouse we wanted to have or how we wanted uh, the trusses inside, we went for the maximum amount of support because we knew that the greenhouse itself would be holding the weight of the tomatoes and peppers. It can be about 600 tomato stems in a 30 by 96 greenhouse, and each of those could have 20 pounds of fruit on them. So it's a lot of weight that we want the greenhouse to be able to hold up. Other considerations might be if there's structures or trees nearby the tunnel. You want to make sure that when the sun is at its lowest point in the sky, if there's a building or trees in front of you, they're not going to cast a shadow on your greenhouse. That will limit some of the light as well as some of the additional heat that you would really need in the winter. You know, you may have a tunnel on the south side of some trees, but you also want to be mindful that if that tree falls over, it's not going to crash your greenhouse. As far as orientation, if you're much north of maybe 38 degrees latitude, running an east-west orientation is pretty important because the sun gets so low in the winter that you really want the broad side of that greenhouse to catch as much light as possible. Arkansas and further south, the sun really doesn't dip too far down into the sky. So if you're working with NRCS for an EQIP uh, grant, or cost share program. The agent that you're working with is most likely gonna be able to work with you on a proper site for your greenhouse. They would look at things like the soil characteristics and the grade, as well as orientation and whether you have shade or trees nearby. If you're just putting a greenhouse uh, independent of that uh, or building one for the first time, some important considerations are uh, the slope of your land and the grade. So you need a flat area, but also you need a flat area that isn't gonna catch a lot of water from uphill. If so, you may need to put in a French drain system or uh, a ditch to divert water. Uh, because the tunnel is a, basically a huge plastic building, it catches a lot of rain and sends it to the side. So it's important that even your growing space itself, the tunnel is built up a little bit to help shed water away from the tunnel. The worst thing that can happen is you, the water just goes into the tunnel, creating basically a swamp, and it's really hard to get that dried out. I think the most critical things when you're building a greenhouse is to kill off perennial weeds and grasses. So where we're building our tunnel today, through the growing season, we've had a plastic tarp on the ground, killing all the grass and the weeds. That's really important because if you till it, build your greenhouse, and then plant your plant, a month from then it's just going to be a solid jungle of vines and all these perennial weeds. But now that you have the tunnel there, you can't really get a tractor in very easily, especially in the corners of the greenhouse. And then you're going to have weeds around 
where the posts actually are driven into the ground. So doing the weed control on the front end before the greenhouse is even built is really important. We did have to build up the grade. We had about a two foot drop from the top to the bottom of our tunnel. And so we used a tractor and a mini excavator to push some dirt up around that side. Once the tunnel is up, I would advise before finishing the end walls, run a field cultivator or a subsoiler through the tunnel to help loosen the hard pan. That would be the time to do it. We use a tractor to help us put up the purlins and to drive in the side posts. And so because that tractor is moving back and forth across the soil, it creates a lot of compaction. So being able to rip it or loosen the soil is really important before you get started. Otherwise, you'll be doing a lot of broad forking to help loosen those hard layers. The next consideration would be fertility. So. Uh, for us, each tunnel that we've constructed has been on land that has not had a crop or a cover crop on it before. So we wanted to give a good jolt of fertility, so we brought in probably 2,000 pounds of compost into each tunnel, so about three inches deep in compost. Compost is a great instant burst of soil life, nutrients, and trace minerals, but it can be high in salts because you're creating what is really an irrigated desert. It's a place where there's zero rainfall. So because of that lack of rainfall, you're not really able to wash excess salts away from your soil. So if you're irrigating with salty well water, it's going to be really important to limit your amount of compost. So we do a one-time jolt so we can start getting stuff in there and growing. After that, we're only gonna mend with things like feather meal or azomite or for trace minerals. So because salts can build up in your soil, what we try and do is we'll bring in microjet sprinklers and do some heavy irrigation and it helps flush out those excess salts. Another option would be because this plastic behind me is only rated for about four years, you could take the plastic off, allow the natural rainfall to flush away excess salts, and then cover crop it and give that tunnel a chance to rest before you use it again. Assembly may run between two and $3,000 if you bring in a team to do it. And a team of four people can usually knock it out in two days, maybe even one day with some pre-assembly. You can do it yourself. I've seen folks that can just do it from the bed of a truck, uh, though you'd have to pound in the post either by hand or some sort of pneumatic post driver. We use a tractor and it really speeds things along using the bucket to push down each post into the ground. And then when we go to place the purlins, the bucket or forks on the tractor can lift each purlin into place and set it on the posts. And that really helps speed up the process. Thanks for taking the time to watch our video today. We hope you like what you're seeing and that you will like and subscribe and follow along with us on our journey and all the content we're producing. Uh, drop us a comment if you have any questions, we'd love to follow up.